Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another exciting session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing science, bringing adventure, bringing conservation into classrooms across North America, across the world. So very excited about today's session. We have Daniel DeVoe beaming in live from Hawaii. But before I introduce him, I'd like to just introduce the four classrooms we have joining us. We have a group of classrooms from across, right across North America today. So um, first class, we have Mr. Greenfield's grade fives from New Jersey. Let me just turn on your mic if you want to say hi. All right. We have Mrs. Braddy's grade sevens from Farmington, Missouri. I'll turn your mic on if you guys want to say hi. Hi. All right. We have Mr. Gallagher's grade five from San Antonio, Texas. If you want to give a shout out. There they are. And last but not least, just up the road from me, we've got Mr. Londos's class. He's got some grade sixes and sevens with him today from Acton, Ontario. So they're just making their way in from recess. So a few of them are there. Hi, guys. Say hi. 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 All right. Looks like they're pumped to be here. So a little intro for Daniel. He's the Director of Science Operations at uh, the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope in the town of Imea. Um, the telescope itself is located at the summit of Mount or Mauna Kea, a 4,200-meter dormant volcano located on the island of Hawaii. So that's enough for me. Daniel, if you'd like to take over. All right. Thank you, Joe. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, our telescope basically. So uh, let me just bring up my presentation uh, Do you guys see it? Yep. Okay, good. I got a little ahead of myself. So I'm Daniel Davo, the Director of Science at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So like Joe said, we're at a, a professional level telescope, astronomical telescope at the summit of Mauna Kea. We have a 3.6 meter telescope uh, that operates uh, pretty much uh, every day. So we're located in Hawaii, which is right in the middle of the Pacific, and that uh, we think that really helps for the conditions. We have very good uh, sky conditions here. Uh, here's uh, a zoom in of the archipel archipelago of Hawaii, and uh, the red circle, this is where we are. This is where I am right now in a small town called Waimea. And the blue circle is where the telescope is at the summit of Mauna Kea. And the purple link between the two is uh, basically an internet link. And that's just to show you that we completely operate the telescope with nobody at the summit uh, from Waimea. So it's completely uh, operated remotely. Everything is done over the internet. And there's absolutely nobody at the summit. And the operator at night is actually uh, sitting where I am sitting. This is uh, the room I'm in right now is, uh, we call it our uh, remote observing uh, room. So here's a picture of the summit of Mauna Kea. So uh, you can see the Canada France Hawaii telescope here, uh, right in the middle. There's 13 telescope at the summit up there, all doing uh, very exciting and uh, professional astronomy. So here's another picture of all our building. So this is a five-story building, so it's pretty big. It's not your little telescope in your backyard. And just to give you an idea of the size, uh, down here uh, you have uh, cards, basically, from uh, employees that are working at the summit on that day. So that's just to give you an idea of the scale of the telescope. Uh, we give data, we provide data to five, con six countries, uh, France, Canada, uh, University of Hawaii, that's what that means through the U.S., uh, China, Taiwan and Brazil. So we're truly an international corporation. We have scientists from all over the world uh, that use our telescope. So here's a picture of the telescope itself. So that's from inside the dome. So again, just to give you an idea of the scale, this here down here uh, is a, a person basically standing on the floor. So there's uh, one, two, three guys uh, down there. So it's a, a huge machine. It's a huge beast. And the mirror is right where this uh, red line is. It's a 3.6 meter uh, uh, mirror. For those of you who are in foot and inches, that's about uh, uh, 14, 13, 14 foot. 
So it's a big mirror. It's a, it's a big piece of glass. So uh, in order to do science, astronomers have uh, used instruments. So basically, I, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time explaining to you what an instrument is, uh, basically, and what we use it for. And then I'll move on uh, to the, the science, some of the science we do with it. So it started like this, right? And everybody even today can do that. So this is uh, Galileo looking into his telescope and uh, drawing, literally, pictures of uh, Jupiter and the moons of Jupiter. So basically, the instrument at the time, and you can still do that today, are your eye and your hand, right? You use the telescope, you look into it, and then you draw your pictures of what you see, and then you try to do science with that. Of course, today everything has changed, and we try to do everything automatically, so uh, people, uh, amateur astronomers today can even do it. So basically, the instrument of this telescope is this tiny camera here, is this camera right there, and you take a picture, and this is your recording. So basically, in astronomy, that's mostly what we do. Well, not mostly, uh, all of what we do. Uh, is uh, we take we record pictures for with whatever camera we have and we have all sorts of camera exotic types camera and I'll I'll talk to you about the cameras we have uh, <clears throat> on our telescope but it's that simple we just take pictures that's all there is to it and we try to do science with it so we have at CFHG three main instruments and again they're uh, cameras so. Two of them are called Megacam and Wearcam, so we give names to our instruments depending on what they do and uh, how they're built. And the third one is a spectrograph, but it still involves a camera, and I'll explain that to you a little bit more uh, later. It's called Espadon, uh, which means uh, swordfish uh, in French. So uh, here's a Megacam, so just again to give you an idea of the scale, uh, it's a big camera, so it's on the, the right uh, of the slide. So it's uh, six meters high, which is about 20 feet. And uh, you see, again, a picture of a, a regular six-foot-tall person right next to it. So it's a big camera. Uh, all where you see all the, the shiny things, that's the, uh, where the electronics of the camera is. And right down here uh, is uh, where the detector of the camera is. And uh, here's a kind of detector we're using. So it's quite uh, big, actually, for this camera. This is why we call it mega cam. It's a mega camera. And these uh, individual detectors are pretty much uh, the same concept as what you have in your phones or in your cameras. So today, when you take a picture, you take an electronic picture. So it's the same concept. Of course, uh, the, the, the detectors we use are much more fancy. But in the end, it's the same thing. We record light uh, more or less in the same way. And uh, you can see it here. It's at the top of the telescopes. It's what we call a prime focus instrument. So basically, our guys, uh, they just put it up there, and then we use it at night, and uh, we take pictures with it. Again, just to show you the scale, uh, you have a person down here uh, at the bottom of the telescope. So another instrument, uh, it's called Wearcam. So you see it here uh, at the top of the telescope again. It's the same concept as Megacam, except that it's an infrared camera. So infrared means that you record heat. You don't really record light that you see with your eyes, but you record heat. So here's two exa uh, an example here at the top with two glasses, one filled with hot water and one filled with cold water. And if you take a picture of it with a regular camera or with Megacam, you're going to see uh, the two glasses, basically, what you see with your eye. But if you take a picture with an infrared camera, then you can see the heat coming out of the hot water. Uh, glass and that's very important for us and when we look into objects in space it's very important to be able to determine their temperature and their heat sources and uh, this is uh, uh, one thing that uh, Wearcam can do. Uh, also Wearcam being an infrared camera you can see through some things that you do not usually see through with your eyes so here's an example of a guy holding literally a trash bag and if you take a picture again with a regular camera you'll see what you see with your eye but if you go to the other picture, the picture on the right, if you take a, uh, it with an infrared camera, you literally see through uh, the bag. So when we do astronomy, when you use an infrared camera, you literally see things with, with uh, the infrared camera that you don't see uh, with the optical camera, with the uh, 
a camera that takes pictures of things you can see with your eye. So it's and it's a great advantage, and it allows us to do different types of science. So our third instrument, it's a little more complicated, but it involves uh, also a camera. So it's called a spectrograph. So basically what a spectrograph does, so you have a picture of it here. So I won't go into the details here, but uh, on the right, that, that's the instrument itself. And it's linked to another instrument by 30 meter of fiber optics. So I, I won't go into the details there. You don't really need to know that. But here's what uh, the, the basic concept of a spectrograph is. So basically, on the right, you have a sun, any sun, a happy sun that shines light. And then it shines it on a piece of glass. In, in this case, I've used a prism. And you may or may not know that the prism uh, just decomposes the light in its basic colors. So it's basically similar to what a rainbow is. What the water does when you see a rainbow is that the water just splits the light into colors. So here you see the light uh, coming out of the prism split into colors. And then on the right, you can see the camera. And there's where the camera thing is involved. But it's a little different than what we do with uh, the other cameras, is that we take a picture of that rainbow. And when you analyze the different rainbows coming from different star stars, then you can learn a lot about what they're made of, uh, uh, what their temperature is, uh, what, what their mass is, and all uh, sorts of things. So really, uh, uh, it's called the, the field is called spectroscopy. And basically, a spectrum is a spectrograph because, because it allows uh, astronomers to record spectrum, which is literally the rainbow. It's a big word just to say that we're recording a rainbow. So let just uh, quickly through uh, just a little bit of the science that we do here at CFHT. So basically, we have these three instruments that we offer to our communities. And then they propose to do science with it. And then uh, a committee decides which ones we're going to go. We're going to go in the telescope. And here, we just schedule them, and we make it happen. We point the telescope, we record the data, we take the pictures, and then we send them to the scientists uh, all over the world that have uh, uh, that get data from us. So <clears throat> the first thing that uh, we had a good impact on is dark matter versus dark energy. So uh, you, you may know that uh, we actually don't know much about our universe. Uh, we only know 4% of it. So, and it's down here, that red piece of the pie here. That's 4% of normal matter. So what that means is that when we look out in the universe, all we see that that's similar to us, that we're made of, iron, oxygen, nitrogen, all of these wonderful things, we only see 4% of it. So we detect 21% of it that it's dark matter. So why it's called dark matter, it, it means that uh, it's because it's not shining light. We detect it by secondary means. We don't detect it directly, although I'll show you a picture of dark matter. But again, it's detected indirectly. There are <coughs> excuse me, uh, very subtle techniques uh, that uh, allow astronomers to uh, see that there's dark matter in some areas of the universe. And it accounts, when you count it all up, it accounts for 21% of the universe, which is a huge amount. And the, the latest uh, mystery is the dark energy, which is the green uh, section of the pie. And that accounts for 75% of the universe. And uh, the, uh, the dark energy, basically, again, it, we call it dark because we cannot see it. It doesn't shine light. We detect it by secondary means. And it's basically a force that pushes on the universe. And uh, this, this, uh, this force is very mysterious. We have absolutely no clue where it comes from. Uh, we do not see it on Earth, uh, although it doesn't mean it's not there. But we don't have a way of detecting it. And uh, it composes. 75% uh, of the universe. So it's a huge component of the universe. And here at CFHT, uh, our scientists did quite a bit of work uh, into characterizing this dark energy and this dark matter. So I'll show you here a picture uh, of dark matter. It, of course, it's not a true picture of dark matter. It's a, a secondary detection. So basically, the blue areas that you see uh, are uh, where we think that dark matter is, basically. And the, uh, the uh, yellow dots, all the other stuff, that's all galaxies we can see with our eye. So using uh, 
very subtle techniques uh, using Megacam at CFHD, one of our cameras, scientists are able to figure out that there's mass there, there's matter in this blue area. But that's all we know about it. We don't really know what it is, we don't know what it's made of, and it's uh, quite an active uh, field uh, in uh, uh, astronomy today. So the other thing I'm going to talk to you about, and it's quite exciting, and it's a, a field really that's booming, it's uh, the detection of extrasolar planets, and I'm sure you guys have heard about that. So here at CFHD, we do uh, some research on that. We're not uh, one of the main uh, facilities that uh, does main research, but uh, we help, and uh, we do also characterization of planets. So just to show you, and we've discovered the first one too, so just to show you uh, how uh, the field is booming, so this graph here shows uh, you probably can't see it, but uh, the, horizontal, uh, the horizontal axis starts in uh, 1988 and ends in 2014. And the columns that you see are just the number of planets outside of the uh, solar system that were detected by astronomers that year. So you can see the last, the last one, 2014, it goes up all the way to uh, more than 800. So this field is really booming. Now I think there's uh, more than 2,000 uh, or close to 2,000 uh, planetary candidates, planet candidates uh, that need to be analyzed. So we're finding more and more. But where you see the arrow, that's the first one that was detected in 1989. And that was done here at CFHD. Uh, the first uh, planet that was discovered was here at CFHD. At the time, it was a difficult detection, and people weren't too sure if it was a planet or not. But now today it's been confirmed and that's really a planet. So that was really the first discovery of exoplanet, of an exoplanet. So basically what we're looking for and you know what's really interesting in that field is that you want to have, you want to find planets in the habitable zone of their star. So what I mean by habitable zone, here you can see if uh, in this picture, if a planet is too close to its star, then it's too hot. It's like Mercury that's really, really close to the sun and it gets really, really hot. It's hard to have life as we know it, life like ours. So keeping, keep in mind that when we uh, do this type of thing, uh, it's, we're looking for life like our life, water-based life, uh, animal-type life like we see on Earth because we don't know anymore. We don't know more life than what we know on Earth. Now, in the green zone, you can see it's just right. The temperature is just right for the planet to have liquid water. So that's really the key question, is that can you find liquid water, water on the surface of the planet? And what's in, when it's in the green zone, you can't find liquid water. When it's in the red zone, it's too hot. So Like there's no water. On, we don't think there's any water on Mercury because it's too hot. It's too close to the sun. So And then if you go further out, then it's too cold, and the, the, there might be water like there is on Mars, but it's all frozen. It's all in a solid state. So we're looking really for these planets in the green zone. So here's another depiction of it. So you can see on the top, you can see the Sun, <coughs> and you can see uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. So you can see that Earth and Mars are in this blue, pale blue area, which is the habitable zone around the Sun. But there's another star here, which is called uh, Gliese 581. Don't worry too much about the name. We don't get really exotic names in astronomy, <laughs> just numbers. And um, so that planet, uh, that star, I'm sorry, has a different distance for a habitable zone because it's a smaller star, it's a cooler star. And here are the planets that we found around this star. So planet, so it's called uh, Gliese 581e, Gliese 581b, c, and d, and d seems to be close to the habitable zone. So that could be a candidate for a planet in uh, the habitable zone of its star. So we're finding more and more of them. So right now, uh, these are the candidates that I pulled out. I think there's a little more than that now. But we, we have close to 20, uh, maybe a little more than 20 candidates planet candidates that can have water on their surface. So that means that life as we know it is uh, likely to happen. Now, is, is there life or not? We don't know. It's just we're just making an, an hypothesis here that when 
you have water, you will find life. Because here on Earth, as soon as there wa there's water, we find life. And uh, oftentimes, in very uh, difficult areas, like uh, at the very bottom of the ocean, uh, life is thriving there way more uh, than we thought it was ever uh, possible. And even scientists didn't think before uh, they had submarines to go deep enough that there could be life there. But on the other hand, uh, but on the contrary, life is thriving down there. And there's also life in uh, in the, the South Pole in areas where uh, between blocks of ice there's some liquid water there and the bacteria can develop there. So I'll stop here and uh, take questions. So just in conclusion, uh, you know, CFHT, we do science from stars around us, planets around us, all the way to uh, the edge of the universe, and we try to understand uh, basic questions uh, about our, uh, our universe. I'll stop here. All right, Daniel, thanks so much. That was a great summary of the telescope itself as well as the science that's going on at uh, CFHT right now. So let's jump right to some of our classrooms. Let's visit Missouri and see if our grade sevens have a couple questions for us. Let me turn their microphone on. All right. Uh, how, how long did it take to build the telescope? Oh, very good question. So it took about 10 years to build it. So construction started in 1969. And it's not easy. It was not easy at the time. There was no electricity at the summit. There was not a paved road like we have right now. And it took, we had to take these big pieces because the telescopes get shipped. The telescope gets shipped into smaller pieces, but they're still pretty big. Put in a truck and brought up and then assembled at the summit. So that took overall, that took about 10 years. Construction finished in 1979, and they had the first light. Uh, I think late 1979 or early 1980 or something like that. Thank you. All right, great what? question. Let's snag another one. Um, what was the purpose of building the telescope? What was the purpose of building the telescope? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. So at, at the time, uh, Quite frankly, uh, there were not that many big telescopes as we have right now. So in astronomy, the bigger the better. I mean, we, we want bigger telescopes. And at the time, uh, astronomers wanted to see further into the universe and explore things that are fainter. So when you look up in the sky and you look really, really far away, uh, the fainter some things get, the farther it is, and just, just an effect of the speed of light. So what scientists wanted to do was to go farther and look at fainter things and discover more things about the universe. So that was really the purpose at the time. And <coughs> sorry, they found out that Mauna Kea was a, a great site to build a telescope, and uh, they just decided to build it there. But it was really to advance our knowledge of astronomy and see things that we had never seen before, uh, 1979. Thank you. All Welcome. right, let's snag two questions from, let's go to Mr. Greenfield's class in New Jersey. Do you guys have a couple questions for Daniel? Okay. How are your telescopes programmed? How are the telescopes? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Could you speak How up a little bit? How are the telescopes programmed? Oh, programmed. Oh, very good question. Great question. So, quite frankly, we use a, a whole hodgepodge of programming languages. So, first thing, we try to use uh, free operating systems. So, we use free software a lot. So, software that we share with others and that other others give to us. So we have uh, all sorts of languages. So it can be programmed in C, Perl. We're using also Java, depending on uh, what we're, what the application is. So we hire some. We have something like uh, seven or eight full-time programmers with us that uh, just help us uh, run the telescope. Just to give you an example, uh, the software to move the telescope itself to move it around and point it 
it's uh, what's called the uh, real-time uh, software, meaning that it runs in memory, and it's really, really fast, because with the when we move the telescope, we don't want to wait for the software, let's say, to access the disk and then uh, wait for our commands. When we send a command, it's got to go through, and it has to work right away. So we, we use a live memory operating system to move the telescope. So that's one of the systems we have. Uh, we use a lot of uh, Java, which is what you see on the internet most of the time, to interact with people, to interact with our observers, uh, to have windows and things like that. So all sorts of things. So it's, it's programmed in all different ways. But the important thing is that we try to use free software, because for us it's, uh, it saves a lot of money. Thank you. All Welcome. right. We have another question for Daniel. What's the most amazing thing you've seen in your telescope? Oh, very good question. Uh, let me think a second. Uh, there are several, i got to admit. I think the most amazing one was what we called the uh, gravitational arcs. And maybe I'll show you an example of that. Uh, let me just give me a second. So this is something that was uh, discovered here uh, at the Canada France. And so you may see, there you go. <laughs> Do you see it here? Yeah. So the, these are um, arcs, basically. So you see these uh, these elongated things here? See those things that are elongated? So these are gravitational arcs. You see that the, these are uh, curved here. So these are objects, round, more or less round objects, but that are behind other galaxies. And basically, gravity acts as a lens. So this is quite a phenomenal effect, actually. And it was predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And it was only observed. We actually discovered the first one uh, here at Canada, France. And uh, these are truly spectacular images. And it's, it's something that doesn't come easy. You see one here. I've zoomed in on one. You see that red stripe there. Basically, that, stri that stripe is just a galaxy that's round like this one, but it's behind it. And it, this galaxy acts as a lens and deforms it. Just like a lens, a regular lens, when you look through it, you see things that are deformed. If you look through the bottom of a glass that's made of glass, uh, you look through it, everything behind it will be deformed. So that's the kind of thing, but with gravity. So it's something that's uh, not subtle and uh, not intuitive. But uh, quite frankly, i got to admit, that's the, that's the most... Uh, amazing thing I, I ever saw in the telescope. All right. Great questions. Um, Mr. Golahar's class in Texas, do you have a couple questions for Daniel? And I think I'll just need you to turn your mic on for me as well. I can't control it from this end. Uh, yeah, actually, we, uh, that's one thing I didn't talk about. Very good question. Uh, we have programs, a lot of programs that are just uh, aimed at detecting new asteroids and uh, new comets. So every night they look, and Megacam is a really good camera for that because it has a big field of view. It takes a, a picture of a big chunk of the sky. And <clears throat> basically we have a pr programs that look for asteroids and comets in those images. And regularly they find new ones, ones that were not known, so we need to put them in a catalog, and then we try to take another picture of them to know what their trajectory is so we know it won't hit the Earth. <laughs> so uh, we do uh, detect them uh, regularly, actually. Every night we have programs that look at them and try to find them. Very good question. Thank you for asking that. That's something I didn't talk about during my talk, but it's well, a big contribution of CFHT to science. Awesome. All right, let's grab another one. How far can the telescope see? Telescope see. 
Uh, <clears throat> very good question again. So how far you see depends on how big uh, the mirror is, literally, how big your main lens is. So I told you uh, at the beginning of my talk that we're uh, 3.58 meter, something like 14 foot mirror. So that allows us uh, to see at a certain distance, but fairly quickly things become too faint for us. So when you have a bigger mirror, let's say uh, there's another telescope on Mauna Kea that has a 10 meter mirror telescope, which is 30 feet. So they see fainter. So uh, I would I would think we see it about uh, uh, tens of <clears throat> 10 billion uh, light years, something like that. 10, 12 billion light years. So it's far. It's really, really, really far. <laughs> it's so one one light year is the time it takes for light is the distance that light travels in one year. So that's that's a lot because light light travels really fast. And the closest star to us is four light. So if we were to go at the speed of light and try to get the closest star, it would take four years. So what we see, the faintest we see is uh, 10 billion light years. So if we were to travel to that place, it would take 10 billion years. It's a little hard to grasp the concept, but it's really, really far. <laughs> awesome. All right, great questions. And uh, Acton with Mr. Londos. That oh, no. That's what I just said. He yeah. stole it. Um, how many planets have you found outside of our solar system? You don't have to leave. Yeah. So, uh, I think, I don't want to say anything stupid. I think the count right now is close to 1,000. So that's the number of confirmed planets, meaning that we have a hint that it's a planet, and then somebody else goes and looks at, more, looks at it more carefully, and then they confirm that it's a planet. So let's say that it goes two or three times around its star. You detect it the two or three times, and we do some other analysis. So we have about 1,000 confirmed uh, right now. And there's something like 2,000 candidates. So the candidates means that uh, we have a hint that it's a planet, but we haven't confirmed it yet. We don't know. It could be something else, because there's many things that can be confused for planets. So you need to uh, really check and make sure, be thorough, and do everything you need to do uh, in order to make sure it's a planet. So right now we have about 1,000 confirmed and 2,000 candidates. All right, let's grab another question from Acton, Ontario. How many of those planets might have water? So uh, water, well, uh, a lot of them could have water. Uh, about right now, in a, the state of our knowledge, uh, uh, we think that something like 23% of them might uh, have liquid water on their surface. So they're habitable. But that's just based on the thousand that we detected and how many we know are in their habitable zones. So if you do an analysis with that, you come up with about 20, 25%. So we think there's about 20, 25% of the stars, and that number may change, uh, that may harbor uh, liquid water on their surface. So if you look at the stars at night, you can say that one out of five may have liquid, may have a planet around it that has liquid water on its surface, more or less. One out of four, one out of five. All right, another great question. Let's, uh, we're getting close to our time for today. But why don't we just, um, Daniel, if you have time, duck back to each classroom just for maybe a wrap-up question. Okay. So we'll start off, we'll go right back to the beginning, we'll swing back to Mrs. Braddy's class in Missouri. Uh, how long did you have to go to college to uh, work for the telescope? Oh, yes. Great. Thanks for asking this, that question. That's a great question. So uh, I'm an astronomer. So I have, in order to be an astronomer, you have to do a PhD in astronomy, uh, which involves a lot of years. 
I think I, I, I spent something like uh, 15 years in college, if I count all my years. However, that said, uh, we don't only hire astronomers. I mean, we have about a staff of 45 people here, and we have something like eight astronomers. And like I said earlier, we have a staff of seven or eight software programmers. And in order to be a software programmer to work for us, all you need to do is go do software uh, major in college, uh, so which is three, four years. We have also uh, engineers, again, which is three, four years of study, and they can work for us as engineers. Uh, we also have uh, yeah, our observers uh, go to school for about the uh, same thing, three to four years. They either have a bachelor's degree in science or something like that, or major in science, and uh, they can work for us. So it's a whole range, depending on what you want to do. If you want to be an astronomer and do science, you're, you're stuck in school for a while. <laughs> and even when you finish, uh, you're not done with it. Uh, but um, if you want to work as an engineer, as a software programmer, an observer, uh, we hire, that's the majority of our staff. And uh, these guys, they go to school for three to four years in college. All right, that was a really good question. Uh, Mr. Greenfield's class in New Jersey, do you have a wrap-up question for Daniel? Yes. One more question. What is your favorite place to visit? Why? What is my favorite? What is your favorite place to visit? Why? Oh, you know why? Okay. Uh, well, I'm, if I if I answer the summit of Mauna Kea, I'm a little biased, but the summit of Mauna Kea is quite interesting. But uh, the one thing I like that's not related to astronomy is the volcano part uh, on the south side of the island. So here, uh, all the Hawaiian I islands, they're uh, made with volcanic activity. And here on the big island, we have an active volcano that's actually erupting right now. So it's on the south of the island. It's really far from us here. It's about 150 miles from us. But you can drive there. And you can go and see lava flows and fresh lava rocks and all of these things. That's that's just really incredible. I love to go there. That's that's one of, of my favorite places on the island. Good question. I gotta come visit you there someday, Daniel. <laughs> yes, yes, you got a spot, you know that. <laughs> all right. Um, San Antonio, Mr. Galahar's class. Do you have a wrap up question for Daniel? Hold on. Yes, we do. How is real space compared to the, to the movie like Star Wars? How is real space? Oh, compared to movies. Uh, well, there's a lot of things that uh, in movies are uh, difficult to reproduce, and they just don't do it. Like when you're in a ship, when uh, these guys are in their ship in Star Wars, they all walk nicely, and uh, they assume that there's some kind of technology to... Uh, hold you down to the ship because they in space there's no gravity. So right now, if you go into space, you're gonna float around. You, I don't know if you've seen the NASA feeds uh, of the astronauts, but they all float around. There's nothing that allows you to be on a ship to walk on your feet like you'd walk on Earth. You cannot do that. So that's one thing that's different from uh, science fiction movies and. Uh, Regular movies and that, uh, uh, regular movies, <laughs> regular life. I mean, life on, on Earth, uh, uh, in space. And uh, let me think if there's, uh, there's often when I watch science fiction movies, oftentimes there's things that just don't match up, and oftentimes they're, they're a little off with the physics. But uh, I heard that the latest movie I haven't seen it, The Martian, was. Uh, uh, done in, con in consultation with NASA, so which is pretty good. A movie like Interstellar has a good treatment of uh, uh, time uh, dilatation, which is a relativity thing that times, uh, time travel, basically, that time is different if you're close to a black hole than somebody who's far from a black hole. And they have, a, they treated it well, I thought, in this movie. So. It depends on the movie, but the biggest thing is really gravity. 
I mean, in all the movies, there's gravity everywhere. And in, in space, there's gravity nowhere. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing, I think, to me. That, uh, and it's hard for them to do. I mean, to reproduce a zero-gravity environment is really hard. So they just don't bother doing it. All right, very cool question. Uh, one more trip to Acton, and uh, then we'll sign off for today's session. What is our biggest plan from no, no, no. sea? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat it? What is the uh, biggest planet you've ever seen? The biggest planet I've ever seen. Well, uh, what's seen with my own eyes uh, was Jupiter. Uh, that you can see with a telescope quite easily. Uh, Last question, guys. The biggest one that we've detected, uh, I was looking this up this morning, uh, a few hundred Jupiter masses. So the biggest planet detected, uh, I think, was a few hundred, uh, a few hundred times more massive than Jupiter. 100, between 100 and 200. So that's quite big. And there's a there's a fine line there. You know, when a planet gets bigger, I mean, does it become something else? Is, does it become, we have this type of uh, objects that are called brown dwarfs that are halfway between a star and a planet. So there's, there's uh, several things there that may be at play. But the biggest that I know of, I think, is uh, close to uh, 200 times more massive than Jupiter. Okay, well, we're at about our time for today. Daniel, uh, I can't thank you enough for hanging out with us today from the control room of uh, the telescope. And, Thanks for um, getting this opportunity. Yeah, and um, thank you to the classrooms who joined us today right across North America. Some really good questions. So it was a great session today. And, Daniel, I'm looking forward to the next connection we do from CFHT. All right, perfect. <clears throat> thank All right, you very much. Well, all right, we're going to log off for today, so thanks again to everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week.